Cool. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So what I um, was going to um, talk with you guys about today is some research I've been doing looking at um, what we can call mathematical funds of knowledge for Pacifica people. Um, so what I'll, the presentation that I've got today is about a pilot study that I was doing um, a couple of years ago. And now I've been doing quite a um, large funded research study at some schools in South Auckland and working with the families and children there. But so this was kind of the basis of the proposal that I wrote. Um, and I thought it might be quite interesting as well because a lot of the research that I'm presenting here was um, the data was collected in Nui. So I've sent you a book chapter that I've written on it, but um, yeah, so I just thought I'd talk about this and the theoretical framing that I'm using for it. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background about this work and, and why I was doing this, this work is because um, lots of different countries, we've got challenges with equity. And I'm sure Bobby talked to you about that, how in New Zealand, our children who come from Pacifica or Māori backgrounds um, don't, aren't achieving as well as children from other cultural backgrounds. And I think we've also got, um, and I, I think that's typical in a lot of countries. So you have the same um, challenges in the US and similarly in England. And then also I think across uh, Pacific nations or I've done some work in Jamaica and they've also found they've got um, similar challenges with equity for the sh children from Jamaica, for example. Um, and one of the reasons that we, we um, can kind of argue that this happens is because the cultural knowledge for many of our Pacifica learners is excluded from the classroom. And that would be similar. Um, this, the funds of knowledge work that I do originally comes from the US and it was based on work with Latino students. So in Arizona, so these students were in classrooms in Tucson in Arizona and the researchers were looking at why the children weren't achieving as well as they should be and one of the reasons they came up with was because their knowledge from their home from their culture from their family wasn't being included in the classroom so the children didn't have that kind of as leverage to to achieve so so that's the kind of basis the background of what this work is about um, and I think it's also compounded by mathematics as particularly as the subject is often viewed as culture free so I think often we think about um, things like reading, literacy, um, art, social studies, all as having, as, you know, they've got culture embedded within them. And more or less teachers pick up and use that. But mathematics is really one of those subjects which people think is, is just kind of black and white. Um, culture has nothing to do with maths. And then this leads to a really narrow view of mathematics for both for teachers and for the children. So we see children thinking that mathematics is something that's only in school and not related to their lives outside of school at all. Okay, and that was, I think I, I can say that we hear that a lot from the children that we work with in schools in New Zealand, but it was no different in Nui when I was interviewing the kids. So um, and it really makes me very sad because I think about... Um, the interviews I do with the children where they often talk about their culture, Pacifica cultures, Nuean, Kailan, Tokelon, um, it's being, having no mathematics in them. And um, I, I thought, I wondered actually, because originally all our work was in New Zealand, and so I thought maybe it's because it's in New Zealand and, um, and because most of the teachers are Pākehā, you know, Papa. So... I thought maybe it's because of that. But when I interviewed the kids in Nui, they said exactly the same things as the kids did in New Zealand. So the children in Nui talked about um, not really having maths in their culture, about how, um, you know, one of the kids said Islanders can't really do maths and those kinds of things. So I think it's a, it's, um, a bit of an issue everywhere. And part of the work that we're doing is trying to think about how to bridge that um, kind of gap between children seeing maths at school to get them to think about where is maths outside of school and how maths is really part of your life and um, not just something you do at school. 
If you've got questions or anything, just feel free to jump in as I go on, because uh, I'm happy to talk about different points as I go. Okay. So one of the basis of the work was that when I looked into what studies we had in New Zealand or from the Pacific, which investigate Pacifica funds of knowledge in mathematics, there really wasn't any work that had been looking at this. So there's some work that um, some of my colleagues have done in looking at science, for example, um, not huge, but there's some studies which look at Māori um, students kind of scientific knowledge outside of school. And there's quite a little bit, there's quite a bit more looking at like literacy, for example. So um, there have been people who have been looking at what are the funds of knowledge in terms of literacy. And so um, that's quite interesting work looking at things like um, the uh, literacy practices that happen at church and how that could be <coughs> translated to school and what children can achieve from that. Um, and there's been some other work where they well, getting kids in New Zealand and Porirua to um, think about how literacy is part of their lives. It was quite interesting because they were looking at like hip hop music and things like that and how <coughs> that has literacy within it that the kids could draw upon. But the funds of knowledge is this theory, theoretical framing, which I draw upon in my work. Um, really the basic argument of funds of knowledge is that every person, every community, every um family has these funds of knowledge that you draw upon to function in everyday and individual and household functioning okay so and these are things which um, all people and cultures have the kind of bodies of knowledge and skills which you've you've gathered from a historical point and then you kind of it develops and evolves so I know Bobby talked to you about um, te vai vai for example so that would be an example of a funds you know, one fund of knowledge that that we that we have as Cook Island people. Um, so you can start breaking that down and thinking about all of the things that you would need to be able to do to successfully create a tivaivai. And that draws on both um, knowledge of mathematics and it draws on knowledge of literacy and kind of interpersonal skills, social skills to work together. Um, yeah, or if you took... Um, a hair cutting ceremony, for example. So when you have, you know, a hair, hair cutting ceremony, again, that has a whole lot of funds of knowledge that are linked to it, that you pass on to your children, you pass on to your family, you know as a community, and all of these things help people to work together to achieve this. So it was in um, Tucson and Arizona where um, Louis Mole, who was a... Um, researcher who originally came up with this kind of theoretical framing one of the things that the um, Latino families in Tucson do um, quite frequently a lot is have yard sales so he looked at that as a fund of you know potential funds of knowledge related to yard sales so it's kind of like a garage sale I suppose or um, you know fundraising event that the families and community do where they would um, be selling you know things like a garage sale yard sale I guess um, and so their research team looked at that in terms of what are all the things that you have to know and what are all the kind of skills and knowledge that's underlie developing a sale like that and then how does that link to mathematics how does it link to social studies science literacy all of those kinds of things okay and part of your theoretical framing of the funds of knowledge work is that um, one of the reasons that children don't achieve in the classroom is because teachers don't draw upon the funds of knowledge. So number one, teachers might not be aware of the funds of knowledge that the children have. And number two, um, teachers may be aware of it, but they might not see it as relevant to the classroom. And so they don't draw and build on that. So the children are disadvantaged because they're not drawing on the funds of knowledge teachers aren't drawing on the funds of knowledge so that means that the children aren't able to connect to the knowledge that they're bringing to school and the skills that they're bringing to school. Okay, so the research focus that I've been taking in this work, um, and it's been quite a long, long time, I suppose, because I went to um, Arizona in 
2015 and spent six months at the university there looking at the work that they were doing in the funds of knowledge. And then I came back to New Zealand and back to my university and did a couple, like a two-year research project, small-scale research project to look at whether the ideas I had about it were going to work. And then I applied for research funding for it. And then since last year, I've been doing a much wider study with um, about 40 families. So the research focus that I'm looking at is kind of a two-way um, process. So number one, I'm wanting to look at ways that we can um, – how we can provide ways to document and value the mathematical funds of knowledge of Pacifica communities. So what I mean by that is I want the children and families themselves to recognise the mathematics that they engage in outside of school settings in an authentic way. So I'm not talking about homework or, um, you know, like computer activities like maths practice computer activities what I'm talking about is kind of the authentic mathematics that people do and um, looking at how we can get the children and the families themselves to recognize that as mathematics rather than seeing mathematics as just something at school okay so yeah so it's thinking about how can we document that and how can we um, look at the culturally embedded ways of knowing and successful mathematical experiences of Pacifica learners outside of school in everyday settings. Okay, so that's the main kind of research focus. Uh, the project that I'm working on at the moment um, is got two elements. So I'm only reporting on this part here, but the second element that I'm working on at the moment is also working with teachers to think about how teachers can draw on the mathematical funds of knowledge of their students and use that in the classroom. So one of the things that's been quite interesting in the work um, that we did last year was we interviewed the teachers at the beginning and asked the teachers about what they thought children did outside of school that was related to medics. So um, all of the teachers said that they thought children did do things that were related to maths outside of school. When we asked the teachers what things the children did, the main things that teachers thought the children did outside of school related to mathematics <laughs> was shopping, like going, maybe going to markets or just going to shops and buying things. And the other thing that teachers talked about was sports. So um, they thought that the kids were um, would be doing kind of engaging in mathematics through sports. So those are the two things the teachers did. The other question we asked the teachers was, um, how, what, whether they thought that they drew on the kids' kind of funds of knowledge and use that in the classroom. And all of the teachers said, yep, that they developed mathematical tasks which were based on what the children did outside of school and those kinds of things. So that, that was kind of one perspective we had. And then we asked the kids about the same questions. And so it was quite interesting because we've got quite a contrast between that where the children said, when we asked the children, does, does your teacher use problems about your lives outside of school or linked to things outside of school? All the children said, no, not at all. So that was kind of interesting for us. One of the reasons we think that was, was because the teachers thought because they were writing problems about the local community, that that meant it was related to the children's lives. But the children, so they were kind of writing problems about the local environment, I suppose, is a good way to put it. You know, so the kind of harbour near where the school is and um, like local shops and things like that. But the kids themselves didn't see that as part of their lives at all or connected to themselves. So that was quite interesting for us. And then the other interesting thing has been looking at the photos that the kids brought in. And the photos that the kids brought in, um, I don't think any children bought any photos of them shopping. So the kids didn't see maths as, as related to shopping and none of the kids brought in photos about sports either. So actually totally different than what the teachers were predicting. So it's quite interesting in itself. But anyway, that's just a sideline. So yeah, so the research design for the project that I'm talking about today, which was my pilot project, um, we had four schools involved in this. And um, that included two schools in South Auckland, one in West Auckland and one in Nui. And the children who were involved were between nine years old and 14 years old and they participated in it with their families so it wasn't about individual children but it's actually a project where we're 
um, getting families and parents involved as well. Um, we've changed the design a little bit for the project we're doing now. So instead of just having um, what what kind of happened a little bit in the first in our pilot, what we learned from the pilot was that we couldn't just give one child in the family the camera to use. So I'll talk about the camera in a minute because that just caused lots of tension with the kids want, all wanting to take photos and wanting to be part of it. So we've worked out a better design, which we've been using is to have a shared camera for the whole family and um, all the kids in the family, no matter how old they are, are involved in taking the photos and we're interviewing the, the family, the kids together as a family unit. Um, and then also bringing families in at different times to look at the photos as well and talk about them. Okay. Yeah, so our design we're using is, um, I've got down at the bottom photo elicitation interviews. So what the design we're using is, is we have given all the children a camera and um, we run a workshop first of all to um, just explain how the camera works and to talk about the kind of ethical processes of if you're taking photos. So things like just talking to the kids about making sure you have permission from somebody, you know, um, being careful about what you take photographs of. Actually, to be honest, it's not been an issue. The, the children are pretty um, sensible about what they've taken photos of. Sometimes we get like 20 photos of the same thing, but that's okay. We just say to the kids, choose which photos you want to talk about. So, um, and there's a bit of, you know, like they like playing around with the cameras to begin with, which is fine as well. And the, so the kids have got the cameras and in this introductory workshop, we also talked about, um, well, actually, we showed photographs of different things where um, you could, that wouldn't be seen as mathematics, but you could uh, think about mathematics being involved. So um, we had a photograph of um, making otai, you know, watermelon drink, and we had another photo of kids of a uh, rugby game, and then we had another photo, I think, of a tivaivai. And so we asked the families and the children together to think about what would be the mathematics that's in all those different kind of photographs. And um, then we asked the, then we talked to the children and the families about how we'd like them to take photographs of their kind of everyday life or things that they do with their families that they think has mathematics involved. Okay. And so that was the introductory workshop. What we're doing in the schools in New Zealand, we then went to interview the kids about every once every three weeks or so. And um, we use something called photo elicitation interviews. So the kids have got the camera. The day that we're interviewing, we ask them to bring the camera into school. And then we have the um, children come with their siblings and just talk to the interviewer about the photograph. So we just ask them to describe what they're doing in the photograph and then um, you know, give it, give quite a rich explanation of what's happening in the photograph, why they've taken the photograph, and then also to think about um, what's the mathematics in the photograph, or you know, what's mathematical about what's happening there. Okay, so and I'm just going to talk about the questioning in a minute because we we've adapted that as well. We we had to learn from what we did in Nui to to think about how we could um, adapt that a little bit because what we tried to do originally didn't work as well. So um, the analysis that I've used in this, this particular article draws on um, some work by a researcher called Moje, which again is from the United States. And um, the, their work actually was on literacy, critical literacies, not on mathematics. But in their work on criti critical literacies, they argue that you can frame funds of knowledge as four different categories. So they talk about family funds of knowledge, so those would be things that you just do with your family um, in the kind of family space. It means, you know, extended family as well, but like family events, things that you, you do at home with your family, those kinds of things. Then they talk about community. So the community funds of knowledge would be your kind of wider community that you work in. It might be like a church, for example, or um, like a cultural festival, those kind of wider community events. I suppose kind of school will probably come into that, like school-based things as well. Um, and then peers. 
so that's kind of things that that kids do um or you know teenagers do with their friends which are kind of you know um I suppose things like uh sometimes sports or um yeah, I don't know, activities that they do with their peers anyway. But then the other category that they had was popular culture. So um, what they classified under popular culture was things like uh, popular music, um, things like kind of digital things and uh, movies, those kinds of things as well. Okay, so that's the framing that I've used, um, that I started using to try and think about um, the different funds of knowledge that these children are bringing in. And we've been looking a little bit at looking at how um, it falls out in terms of Nui compared to the kids in New Zealand. So, um, and that's kind of brought out some kind of interesting, interesting aspects as well for us. Okay, so what I'm just going to show you today is just looking at what we got from Nui. And so in Nui, we did the we did the design a little bit differently. Um, so in Nui, we gave the kids a camera and then uh, gave, there was about kind of 10 weeks in between us visiting up there. And then we came back and just interviewed the kids once. So in New Zealand, it had been more of a, we interviewed the kids over a number of different cycles and the project that we've got at the moment we interview the kids about every three weeks so um yeah so it's kind of a more regular occurrence but because in the way obviously we couldn't fly up there every three weeks to interview the kids so yeah so we just did it at the beginning gave the outline at the beginning and then went back again after 10 11 weeks to to interview the kids and so we had the students up in the way took between five photographs so that was the smallest amount there was one child who had taken five photographs there was another child who had taken 137 photographs <laughs> so <laughs> we don't interview the kids about every single photograph obviously but yeah we just asked them to kind of pull out the ones that they think are um, really meaningful or the ones that they want to talk about so um, we found that the kids in the photographs, there was really a range of mathematical content. So it included things like angles, so, you know, geometry and measurement, um, statistics, algebraic reasoning, multiplication, rate of change. Oh, I've got statistics twice. Um, you know, all, yeah, so there was really a range of mathematical okay. content. Um, it was quite interesting in a way. We've, we've had quite different res results um, in different, different places. So... What we found in our recent study in New Zealand is that the kids, the first photos the kids took were all focused on number all the time. And um, it was quite difficult to move. Originally, it was quite difficult for the kids to move past thinking about maths as beyond number. So they just wanted to think about taking num photographs of digits and sets of, of objects and things like that. Yeah. But um, we found as time's gone on, they've moved across a range of mathematical content. Yeah. Actually, it's kind of similar in a way, but what happened in a way was the kids took things. We could see lots of different mathematical content. Often when we asked the kids what the maths was, they only focused on the number aspects. So, yeah. So um, if we look at some of what we, some of the kind of findings and what the kids talked about, um, I've got one of the photographs here, which um, a child took. And this photograph was talking about he was talking about spear fishing on the on the reef with his father. So um, we it was quite interesting because when we asked him what the maths was in the photograph, he said that it was how many fish you could catch and then how many you would eat and how many would be left or you know something like that. So it wasn't there wasn't really a rich um, description of the mathematics but then we changed the question and said to him instead just tell us about what you were doing and you know how do you do this and when he started talking about the um, spearfishing with his, with his father and what he would do for it that was when the mathematics really started to come out so that kind of gave us a bit of a um, uh, yeah it made us rethink about our questioning so we moved from there instead of asking the kids what's the maths in the photograph, we then moved to getting the kids just to talk about what was happening in the photograph and the um, 
activity that they were doing and then we can kind of draw out what's what's mathematical about what they're talking about because when we said to him what were you doing he started talking about how when he's spear fishing um that you have to hold the spear like this and then you know you you tilt it a certain certain um point so that was where we he started talking about angles and he was talking about how um depending on the size of the fish that you might move forward or backwards so his dad's got the spear gun he would move forward or back depending on the size of the fish and then the angle would you know he'd tilt it up depending you know when he was going to shoot it and things like that so we could see from what the child was talking about and his gestures and things that he was using that there was a lot of geometry and measurement and mathematical concepts about angle sit that he was actually engaging with but if we asked him what is the mathematics he went to number because that was kind of what he thought about as mathematics instead of recognizing you know the geometry so yeah so that's kind of been interesting for us um we had another kind of example of the family funds of knowledge was um laundry so kids talking about hanging out laundry um, one of the children, oh, actually, and that's been the same in New Zealand. So at the school, we've done it. And this time, we've had quite a few photos of kids taking photos of pegs. So laundry pegs and washing lines. But this child talked about how when he hung, hang, um, was she actually, so she was talking about she hanged things out. And um, what she was talking about is doing tea towels and putting um, two pegs to start with. And then that you would use the one peg in the middle for two tea towels and just put one peg on the end. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So she was talking about um, how if you you start off with two pegs, but then you just use that middle peg to hang the next one, and so you just put one more on the end, and then just one more on the end like that. So that was kind of talking about an algebraic pattern. So we thought that was quite interesting. Um. Uh, this this child here was talking about uh, the um, making a lossy. So um, she was just talking to us about the differences about a lossy is where you make those headbands, but it's a fofo when you decorate it and you wear it so you look nice. Then she started talking about this necklace called uh, Ma'ali and that they have seven strands and you wrap it up. And then, um, uh, and this was getting ready for dancing. So... She also started talking about um, how her body, if she was doing dancing, how her body would make different shapes and use angles and triangles. So you can see here that she's talking about, my auntie told me to put my hand like this and that's got an angle in it um, and it's an angle like a triangle shape. Um, and so she then talked about the dress over here, that green thing, it's the thing where you can make, our ancestors use them for dancing and they're plants and you have to bring leaves so like 72 leaves to make the thing around my waist yeah so you can kind of see in the explanation that she's giving that there's a lot of different mathematics and mathematical concepts that she's starting to talk about and she's also going back to her um you know like the historical aspects of of um your culture and what's passed down from your ancestors Um, what we found too was um, that though Moje or Mohe, I think it's called, um, talks about family funds of knowledge and community funds of knowledge, when we looked at what the findings were from Nui, it was really difficult to separate the family funds of knowledge and the community funds of knowledge. And um, I think that would be probably similar for... Um, islands and the Cook Islands, perhaps. But, and that's because the interlinks between the family and community are really strong because of the collectivist living on the on the island. So, you know, in Nui, your village is, you have your family, but you're really um, part of your village. And a lot of the way that you live is, is linked to your village rather than just your family, you know. So I think in, in maybe in America and um, even in New Zealand that, the community links aren't so strong, but in no way the community links were so strong that a lot of what the kids were talking about was interlinked between your family and your community. So, for example, they were talking about preparing for a hair cutting ceremony in no way, and um, that might, you know, you could see that as a family activity, but what they were talking about was sharing cockpits among the family and the community. 
you know so you it's not just your you don't just have your pig for your family or if you've gone fishing and you're sharing out the fish it's not just for your family but you take them around your village and give it to whoever's whoever's from your village or from other villages as well um and here's a child talking about the um ear piercing ceremony so um this child was talking about when a girl pierced her ears and then there's people who are doing stuff to give to other people and that um and they'd actually taken a photo of the taro that they'd been put out into rows and they had they were talking about having things like uh 238 taro and um putting them into rows of 100 so that people could just go and take those and then they talked about the money actually this is kind of interesting one because at the time um, when we were up in the way, the teachers were talking about how um, the gifting of money had really got out of hand at that point in time in the way because um, people were kind of doing a little bit of trying to give more than each other, I guess. So, and this child was talking about that too. So they said, oh, they got $48,000. I remember the teachers at the school talking about this and being really worried about it because they said, oh, it was like, it had got so out of hand because people were trying to kind of give more than each other that it was really having... Uh, detrimental financial effect on the families anyway um and then they were talking about giving you tea and um tartos and the basket and just the different types of food you know so packets of chicken corned beef half a pig and things like that so you can see again there that there's um this child's really talking about a whole lot of different funds of knowledge that is related to maddox in terms of proportions and ratios um that is drawn upon by people to have something like a ear piercing ceremony. Okay, and then um, the peer funds of knowledge. So the, the really predominantly we found that the family funds of knowledge were really the strongest one that came out and the community ones came out quite strongly as well. But we did have some of the children talking about kind of things which we thought were peer funds of knowledge. So, for example, this child was talking about games that they played at the girls' brigade that they went to. Um, so she'd taken a photo of them playing this game that they called Monday to Sunday and that there was seven chairs and everyone's sitting on the seven chairs and when someone says Monday, Monday has to sit on the first chair and go all the way to Sunday and all the days of the week, they have to run up to the first chair and then the second one sits on Tuesday, third one sits on Wednesday, fourth one on Thursday. And she was talking about um, the chairs I mean you've got time measurement and things like that and that but she was also talking about the speed that people run to the front and sat down so you know so we can see the mathematics into looking at rate and speed and things like that and that um but one of the things that didn't come up at all in Nui um it's been different in New Zealand but in Nui we found that there was not anything that related to popular culture so um yeah none of the kids had anything related to popular culture and yeah like I've got here um, what we found is that the funds of knowledge for the Pacifica children in New Zealand I, I suppose I should also say that um, you couldn't say the student responses in Nui were just Nuean students because um, if you've looked at the book chapter that I sent to Debbie they the students in Nui um, were from a range of different Pacific Islands. So there was a lot of kids from like Tonga and Fiji and Samoa, as well as the Nuean kids. And a lot of the kids in Nui, probably some of the Cook Islands are um, mixed as well. You know, so they're not just Nuean, they're half Nuean, half Samoan, or um, half Nuean, half Pakeha. And yeah, so yeah. So um, although they were, you know, although this was in no way, the kids themselves were um, from different Pacific cultures. But we found that the funds of knowledge for the Pacifica students in New Zealand is quite different than those in Nui, but it's also different on depending on the location of the students. So we found that the kids from West Auckland shared quite different experiences than the kids in South Auckland. Okay, and one of the things that we think is that if we attend to the funds of knowledge, it's a way of highlighting how just because you're from a cultural group, like a, you know, as a Cook Islander, you actually experience being a Cook Islander in lots of different ways. There's not kind of one stereotypical way of being part of a group, but um, a Cook Islander who lives in, in 
parts of Auckland has a different experience than one who lives in other parts okay. of New Zealand or a different country. Okay, and so that's one of our things about attending the funds of knowledge is that um, we can't have, you've got to, re I suppose for teachers, it's about really knowing your kids and knowing the experiences that they have. You can't um, kind of stereotype and think that everybody's going to know about one particular area, even though there's kind of shared commonalities. Um, the other thing which was kind of an unanticipated, I suppose, we hadn't really thought about this part when we designed it, but um, what we found originally was that the kids really thought about mathematics as just being about number. So, I mean, I set out wanting the kids to realise about, I set out wanting the kids to realise how mathematics was part of their lives and part of their lives outside of school. But I hadn't really thought about the kids' actual perception of, of um, what mathematics is. So what we found was originally the children thought of maths as only numbers, just numbers, adding, subtracting, multiplication, division, that's about it. And then what we found is through the kind of act of taking the photographs and talking to the interviewers that the kids themselves have started to really expand what they think maths is. And that's kind of been replicated in the work that we've done in New Zealand. So um, the work that we did last year, we found the kids, like I said before, took photos mainly of numbers and digits and kind of sets of objects. But then since they've, start, since they've been taking the photographs and talking to the interviewers, they've started to um, kind of, I guess, frame things in a mathematical sense. Yeah, so the kids themselves are asking mathematical questions and coming up with problems themselves, even though we're not asking them to. So like, for example, we had kids take photos of seesaws and ask things like, oh, what I'm wondering is, you know, what, why is it when you're on a seesaw that it goes up and down, talking about the kind of weight balance, or ask, taking photos of boats and things and saying, oh, I'm just thinking about like what size engine you'd need to, and, you know, um, what power you'd need to make this boat go at this particular rate and what would make this boat, smaller boat go faster than the bigger boat or what engine size would make the bigger boat go faster and things like that. Yeah, so the kids themselves started kind of seeing maths is framing things and, and kind of looking for a mathematical lens. And this is just a quote from one of the children in the study from Noe. So he said to us, oh, I thought it was going to be a bit hard because everything just seemed normal. But once you have a mindset of looking for maths, it's actually more, more common than you think. Now I see maths as everything and everywhere in the world. Yeah, and that was kind of, we thought that was a nice um, way of kind of framing what had happened with the kids and the kind of change in their perspective about looking at mathematics and where mathematics sits. <laughs> so what, do, what have we learned and what are we kind of learning? Um, yeah, so a big key thing that we took away from this was that we needed to frame our questions in a, in a different way. So we asked the wrong questions to begin with. So when we started, we asked the kids, um, what's the maths in that photograph? And we found that the kids gave... Um, quite narrow answers. Um, I think it was partly because the kids just were thinking about maths as number. So like I said, um, when we asked the question about what's the maths in that photograph, the kids didn't give a rich description and um, it kind of narrowed what we could see. So instead we decided to change the way we're framing the questions. So instead we just really try and get the kids to give a rich description of the activity um, and you know, give it in depth description of what's happening in the photograph and what they're doing in the activity and what it's about and then we ourselves as a researchers can use a mathematical lens to analyze the responses so yeah we've kind of shifted that we're not thinking about necessarily getting the kids to um it does come in i mean the kids are doing it anyway but yeah we just think it's easier for us to see the mathematics to use that mathematical lens rather than the kids because sometimes the language is not not there as well with the children um We've also learnt that uh, photographs really provide a rich context to talk about life outside of school. So one of the things we found is that if we just ask the kids without taking photographs to talk about maths outside of school, it's really hard for the kids to do that. So, and it doesn't really get any easier. But if they've been taking photographs, it's, it, that gives them a context to talk. So it's much easier to talk to the children um, when they've got this kind of photograph, this thing to talk about rather than just kind of talking cold. 
And but it's also we've found that photographs and the cameras uh, tool that helps participants begin to recognise mathematics. So, um, yeah. So so the camera and the act of taking photos themselves is something that that um, widens people's views of mathematics. And the other part is we've kind of learnt that we can really position students and families as experts of their own lives. So in doing this research and doing this work, um, one of, yeah, and I've, I've been challenged a little bit on this, but we originally with the funds of knowledge, it wasn't the funds of knowledge work that they've done in Arizona um, was about teachers going into the children's homes or into community activities that the children were doing. So it wasn't about getting the students or their families to, to share their experiences, but it was about the teacher would go as a guest into the family's home and look for what are the funds of knowledge happening there or try and recognize the funds of knowledge. And so we've kind of like, I guess our innovation to that is to turn it on their head, turn it a little bit on its head and instead position the students and families as the ones to share as experts on their own lives rather than um, have kind of teachers going in. And I think it's been quite effective um, in terms of showing sharing the photos with the teachers in terms of them getting a window onto the children's lives but also a window where the students and the families themselves are in the position of power about what they want to share you know so they've got more control over it um and what's our next step so yeah i guess i've been doing a number of these next steps we've you know been looking at um using this what you can call photo voice is, is um, the methodology that we're using. So photo voice means that um, the children take photos and the families take photos, which has kind of becomes their voice. And uh, that's a little bit what I was talking about before is that instead of um, the teachers kind of having the, the, the voice there, it's about giving the voice back to the students and their families through the act of them taking the photographs. Um, we're working towards empowering communities to see the mathematics um, that they that's related to them. And then, yeah, what we've been doing over the past year is thinking about how can this be shared with teachers. So what we do, what we've been doing with the project that we're working on at the moment is um, having a day where we share the photographs and then plan mathematical tasks based on the photographs that have been shared. Um, and so we have like a planning day and yeah, it's been quite interesting because we're looking across to think about how different um, photographs potentially have different links to mathematics, you know, not just one. So um, we've got quite a lot of Tongan kids in there and they've taken photos of Tawavala um, and we were looking at that in terms of geometry, but we've also been looking at it in terms of algebra um, and also looking at it in terms of measurement. So I guess one of the things that we're sharing with the teachers is um, how there's lots of different mathematics embedded into the context. And uh, it's been quite eye-opening, I think, for the teachers to realise all the mathematics that the children are doing outside of school. And then I guess the other part that's been really good as well is we uh, have re-interviewed the kids at the end of the year and got really different results in terms of the kids thinking about how maths is embedded all through their lives, but also different results in terms of the kids talking about how the teachers saw all the maths the kids were doing outside of school and how the teachers, the tasks that the teachers were using were really related to them and um, that's been kind of interesting as well because um the uh, you know obviously there's kind of six kids in each class who might be involved in the project and there's about and so not like i guess not even all the kids who have taken the photographs they haven't been the basis of the tasks but because of the kind of interlinks between the kids at the school even if it's like their cousin or their friend's photograph that's been used or context being used the kids still see it as related to their lives yeah cool okay so that's that. hold on i'll just work out how to stop yeah so okay so yeah awesome so what questions have you got people so many. So many. Well, um, there's a situation that's really interesting listening to that. Um, 
Jody. Jody, yep. Jody. Um, it reminded me when I was teaching subject, uh, Matt said, the sponge of knowledge. Oh, this term, it's really good to know. It's, it's the real life situation, practically, that the children are engaging in outside of the classroom, in their homes, especially going to the shops. Hey, we've always taken for granted not to take pictures of our kids or even us <clears throat> in the shops. Or They know how to take photos um, anywhere, mm -hmm. but there was never that um, um, questions mathematically uh, from these photos. So it's really good to hear that um, research that you've done. But I, I was having another question before you were studying, still in my mind. Uh, this is a particular child, a very remedial child, special need. He knows how to speak the language, but then these assessments in the level one, when he was in level one um, with maths, he failed. Failed, failed from down, failed, failed, level one, failed, failed. And he was never had the chance to, well, maybe there wasn't in, according to the requirements of those standards, eh, to answer the questions like using videos in the real, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's still part of that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, funds of knowledge, I mm. think, you know, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think you can use what we've been talking about to think about assessment as well, because actually I'd say that, a, a, like, you could ask kids to take photographs and talk about them, and that could be part of your assessment of mathematics, especially with your young children starting school. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. That's been quite interesting because we've got five-year-olds, quite a lot of five-year-olds in the study that we've been doing last year. We've got a lot of five-year-olds involved in it as well. So, um, and actually in some ways they've taken much more, they've got a much wider view of mathematics than the older kids do. So we've had, yeah, interesting photos from them. Um, sometimes, you know, some like a number of photos, especially I have to admit when I looked at some of the photos before I read the kids' explanations, I'd think, what so like <laughs> there was like one one photograph a kid had taken of a picture of cellophane you know like uh yeah so it's just a sheet of cellophane it was one of the little five-year-olds and I looked at the photo and I thought well, why is she taking that and then when you read the explanation she said what she liked to do was play like birthday parties at home so she'd wrap up yeah so she'd get the piece of cellophane and try and wrap different toys up in the piece of cellophane to see if it fitted yeah, and I, yeah, 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 and I thought that's really like rich kind of, you know, thinking about measurement and, and actually the some of the photos have really challenged the teachers' um, conceptions of what kids over, especially the lockdown period, because this, you know, the project was happening over the lockdown period, and I think, you know, there was some perceptions about how uh, kids in South Auckland were just sitting around doing nothing and all this kind of nonsense, but we had the photos taking we had the kids taking the photographs and it was really interesting seeing all the things they got up to. Like we had, actually it was Cook Island, a little group of Cook Island girls there. Um, uh, they're part of the family who do the, what's the drumming group? You know, the yeah. really famous, the the one in New Zealand that's really, is that Drums of the Pacific or? Yeah. 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 So they're, they're in that, they're in the group and their parents are in that as well, but they had a whole lot of photos of doing tiling, you know, so um, in their grandma's bathroom, they were tiling the grandma's bathroom and they're taking photographs of them tiling and we we're thinking about, it was quite nice because we were doing geometry and tessellation and all of those kinds of things. But it was quite, um, for the teachers, that was a big surprise for them to see these kind of things that the kids were doing. So, yeah. Jody, I me, um, your research for our course that we're doing, um, you know, the, the theoretical framework of the funds of knowledge, but also the fact that you got, you started your project and then you realised that it wasn't giving you the information you wanted and you weren't yeah. frightened to adapt it and change it and to reframe the question. Yeah. And so, I, you know, we're, we're, these teachers here are going to do a, a, a action research project around 
Maori language back in their schools or on their islands and um, and using their own funds of knowledge. But I think, you know, culturally, the funds of knowledge around real kuki airani will be really interesting. And I love that, um, you know, that idea that we don't, that we can use photos, which is a very, you know, normalised way of doing with selfies and iPhones yes. and cameras and that children are now, you know, it's just part of the way that they do things. And so there's quite a lot of research being done with photos. A friend of mine at the University of Auckland around gender and sexuality has got um, high school students taking photos. And I think it's a really interesting way. Uh, I think they do need some training. But, you know, so a number of things that I think Jody's presentation can sow seeds for you in terms of that cultural knowledge, understanding that teachers are not always the experts, but that children and parents and families are the experts, and that there's um, that funds of knowledge from families and communities and villages and schools is something to really tap into. So, I um, yeah, so mm -hmm. lots and lots of links that are useful for us to consider and think about. Thanks, Jody. Yeah, no worries. I, 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 I do. I, Oh, I do think using the photographs is really important. I did that in my, so when I did my master's research first, I just tried to interview kids after lessons in the classroom and it was really hard to get the kids to talk. So um, that was a big learning point for me as well. And then when I started doing my PhD research, I actually used that in the classroom as well. So I got the, I didn't get the kids to take the photos, but I took photographs myself of different points during the lesson and then used that to get the kids to talk about what was happening in the lesson and that just, yeah, I, I, I'm a big advocate for using photographs because, yeah, I think often when you try and interview children particularly, if, you try and, if you're working with children and you try and interview them kind of cold, that they just um, get really, there's a power imbalance there and they get really kind of choked up. They don't know how to talk. They don't know what to say, you know, so you get that. But I've found like with a lot of kids, even your really shy, quiet kids, if you have a photograph and they're just talking about the photograph, then yeah, way easier to get them to chat away to you and talk about and, you know, yeah. So yeah, big advocate for that. <laughs> um, good morning, Jody. Just listening to your uh, presentation, it's awesome. It's um, giving some ideas. But I was just looking while I was, while you were talking about photographs and that. Um, just give me an idea, but you know, when you do assessments, I suppose, I'm going back to a, a school, I suppose there's another way you can assess a student that has um, remedial. <clears throat> who are, you know, special needs. Mm -hmm. I don't know. To me, I feel that's another idea that you've given, you know, but yep. then so it depends on the topic you are teaching the uh, class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I suppose it's, you got to find other ways instead of just interviewing the, the people to for your research, which I compliment you on that for, yeah, so it's giving us ideas. So I think there's always other ways mm. that what you would have presented to us. So I thank you for that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I think, yeah, th yeah, there's definitely power and kind of visual imagery. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Jody, um, you talked about um, the children, you know, they talk about maths and this claim and everything, but they don't really recognize the type or the term of uh, mathematical terms that they're doing. Uh, is that normal? Yeah, I, I think um, your language... Um... Like, I think your mathematical language is something that we have to grow as teachers, and I don't necessarily expect the kids... Um, I guess, you know, I think about myself and all the years I've been doing research in maths and probably, um, I mean, like if I, ta I still only have specialized knowledge in some areas of maths. Like if I took geometry, for example, I still have to go and look up, you know, um, when, when we were doing geometry, I had to go and look up what the geometrical terms do meant and, you know, because that's not my area of expertise. So I think there's a whole language associated with mathematics, which is really wide. And I don't, I think anybody apart, like 
you know, I think even mathematicians wouldn't have the mathematical language necessary to to articulate that because, you know, usually you just do a subset. Like I would do a lot of work in algebra and um, so I can really confidently talk about all the algebraic terms. But yeah, like I'm saying, if I went to geometry, then I still have to go and, you know, look up the terms to think, am I saying the right term? Have I got the right one? So I think it's unrealistic for us to expect kids to be able to Speak. I'm really pleased to hear that because it, otherwise, you know, that even someone that is a researcher in mathematics still has to check. Oh, yeah. Oh, otherwise, yeah. we just feel totally incompetent. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. No, like, I mean, yeah, I can confidently talk about stuff in algebra, but like, my daughter was looking at different types of triangles and I was like, oh, what, what are they? I was like, which are, oh, equal? I know equilateral. And I was like, I know right angle, but then I was like, I don't know what type that is. I'll just have to have a quick check. So I think it's about like, and I think that's with kids too, your students. What we need to do is actually give them the skills to be able to look up what they need to find out to describe it. Yeah. So, um, you know, so there's a big part of that rather than having to know absolutely everything. You need to find out. You need to know how to find out what you don't know. Okay. So within that um, level, um, um, the lower uh, classes, and then when do you really expect them to be able to recognize that? Yeah. Well, I think it's about teaching the kids the language. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I think that you, yeah, we, I draw a lot on getting the kids to use gesture, so like hands and movements, and then to talk, and then in the classroom, I start using the correct mathematical terms and kind of um, trying to, you know, right from five years old, introduce them to mathematical terms, but without expecting, it's, I suppose it's a little bit like your language learning as well. You know, so I think when you're learning language, you have resources, you have things up on the wall so that you can give children an aid to actually become, uh, what's the way to put it? You know, become familiar and become comfortable with the language that you're using. I think that's the same for maths and I think we don't do it enough. So like I always think that teachers in classrooms should have a maths language wall so that you actually have terminology up on the wall and you can get kids to use that as a resource to talk mathematically about what they're doing. And the more we do that, then the more kids pick up and become familiar with it. Yeah. Okay. I like that one. I like the one where you um mentioned about outside <clears throat> maths where um the children go shopping and really involved in knowing that they're using maths as well. Mm. So they can play <clears throat> in the classroom in their maths time when they do when they do some problem solving stuff and actually going outside the classroom and do the actions in that Yeah. Yeah, and kids saw that a lot, and we've been using that a lot at the school, because actually, um, when they were doing geometry, for example, we did um, a lot of work on um, turns, you know, half turns, quarter turns, full turns, and if you look at um, dancing, for example, you use half, well, it was quite funny, because I said you can't use Tongan dancing, because they dance too slow, Cook Islanders do the best turns in dancing, <laughs> so if you look at Cook Island groups doing dancing, um, doing you know, they do, you do half to, you do a quarter turn, you do half turn, you do a full turn, you know, and so that's that kind of maths that's like embodied in, yeah. in movement, yeah. All right, we've got someone doing, thank you, thank you, thank you. Who's going to say thank you? Okay, Jody, we, um, right to the end of our um, work on behalf of our uh, directors and let's involved to teach us in our work. I'd like to say thank you very much for your uh, answer to knowledge that you've given us today. Thank you very much. We um, look, maybe look forward to seeing you. Yes, have a holiday. Yeah, thank you.